Frida, I am so glad that you were able to join me today to talk about diversity in venture capital. Um, we have had uh, a journey together. I first met you just as I was moving out to Silicon Valley to head up diversity at Pinterest. And uh, at that time, I joined the Diversity Advocates Group, which you had founded. Yep. Uh, you are a founder of k Capital. You are a founding member of Project Include. I mean, there are so many amazing things you're doing. So thanks for taking the time to, to chat with me. My today. pleasure. I love our conversations. Likewise. Likewise. And I would have never imagined, um, you know, when I spoke with you as an operator at Pinterest, that I would now be doing this work in the context of diversity in venture capital. Um, and just as the genesis of this conversation, uh, you know, a few months ago, we were on a call with a number of other firms talking about this issue. And KPOR, the very thesis of the work that you're doing, um, gap closing work, has been at this and on this topic for so so much longer than, say, last June when a lot of other folks joined the conversation. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the thesis of of KPOR Capital because you you've been you look a little different, I would say, than maybe some of the firms uh, in the industry. Well, great, and I'm always happy to talk about our our journey. It's been lonely, and so we're delighted to have lots of other firms jumping on. Um, so we did many things as first. So for 10 years, starting in 2011, 100% of our investments have been, as you described, gap closing. So that the core business is a technology business. It's early seed, pre-seed, sometimes series A, but it's an early stage tech company whose core business closes gaps of access or opportunity or outcome for low income communities and or communities of color. So it's not a philanthropy model. It is not a Tom Shoe model, buy one, give one away. It is that the business itself, if it succeeds, we look at who benefits and we wanna make sure that those gaps are closed for the communities we're prioritizing. So that's been our journey for with 100% gap closing impact for 10 years. In 2019, uh, we put out our first ever impact report. And there we covered all of our investments from 2011 through the end of 2017, because anything more recent at that point in time, hard to know what the real valuation is. Uh, so at that point, with 59% uh, underrepresented founders, that includes all women as well as Black and Latinx men and women. Uh, so over that entire time period, more than 100 companies, uh, we beat top quartile financial returns uh, against benchmarks of PitchBook and Cambridge Associates. So for all those naysayers, for all those years who said, impact investing is concessionary, or you can't get returns with diversity-focused investing. So we are both, we have both an impact lens and a diversity lens, and we beat top quartile returns. So we think it's very important that more people understand that, um, that there are choices to be made here about what good or harm or combination the businesses that you invest in do in the world. That is so powerful because this perception of impact or profits mm -hmm. has been very pernicious. Yeah. Uh, and I and I think even some of the response to um, George Floyd's murder and you know what we saw in 2020 um, led a lot of people to say, "Hey, what can I do?" Which is a very good thing. Um, but they there was still this kind of conundrum of, let me create something that's impact focused, not sure if we'll have returns. So I think that the example that you've given really kind of counteracts that assumption. Well, I hope so. And it certainly has been our experience and not just with one or two companies, but again, with over a hundred companies over what is now a decade in time. Uh, and many of our companies are just doing amazing work in the world. The other thing I should add is that k Capital's investment thesis includes that we are sector agnostic. So we have healthcare investments, we have ed tech, we have fintech, we have justice 
focus. We have food, ag, sustainability, energy. So we have a huge range of sectors that all fit within the gap closing thesis. Yes, yes. Well, let's talk about founders a little bit. Uh, and, let, and let's talk about founders that are uh, underrepresented, underestimated, mm-hmm. right? And um, we know that overall, underestimated founders, ethnic minorities, women receive less funding than their white counterparts. Uh, they receive worse, worse terms. This happens early. This happens at the seed round. Um, and, you know, the data has been out there in terms of the capital that goes to underrepresented founders, particularly women of color from underrepresented backgrounds being below 1%. Um, and then we actually in 2020, as we saw the, the market boom, I know everybody everybody in this industry is working, you know, triple time. Uh, actual funding that's gone to women has dropped. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what what does what does Kpor know based on what you've seen and what the work that you've been doing? You know, we're co-invested in a few companies with talented Black women founders like Blavity and Air Protein. What does Kpor know that the industry could and should be doing differently to build relationships with underestimated founders? Well, I would say what the industry needs to do is to start by holding up a mirror, because a lot of what we have discovered over this period of time is a better and deeper understanding of our own biases. We tend to invest in potential of people who look like us. So if I see somebody and they remind me of me when I was younger, then it's like, okay, I'm going to back them in the way I wanted somebody to back me. We invest in people who are different than we are, um, only based on what they've already accomplished. And I think that transfers over to the size checks we write and when we write those checks. That makes so much sense because I feel that a lot of times the default is, we don't, where's the pipeline? And of course, as you said earlier, this translates from our earliest work, working with large you know, corporations across sectors. Um, it goes to, well, we just, we haven't met folks. So a lot of the times the conversation starts at, well, I've got to build my network. And I think that's important. And I want to, I want to, I want to double down on that in a second, but holding up a mirror to your own series of investments sounds like a really important, critical, introspective, Step. Do you think that there's, um, you know, the willingness for firms to do that? Uh, the you know, and I know that depends firm to firm, mm-hmm. uh, but it's it's hard when you feel like you're already doing the right thing to say maybe I've been making some difficult choices. Well, I think it, everybody can learn by introspection, and I would hope and encourage all firms. We can learn more. We do all the time. Uh, But I think it's really important who sits around that table also making the investment decisions. Um, And there's plenty of research about, you know, different investment decisions are made based on the demographics of who is sitting at the table. So that suggests another really important thing to do, which is to diversify your investment team is one of the best ways to attract um, underrepresented founders underrepresented, underestimated, overlooked. We have so many wonderful. Yes. <laughs> all of the above. All of the above. But I think it's really important. And in our earlier days at Cape War Capital, before all of this became so trendy, we could track who founders reached out to by demographics. So they would, white women would reach out to me more often. Um, and Black and Latinx founders, men or women, would reach out to our Black investment team members or our Latinx team members, regardless of who specialized in what sector, regardless of seniority, Um, and because they felt like, okay, this is somebody who might understand me. And I don't even know how conscious it was, but we actually could track where, um, where founders reached out, which brings up another important point in the evolution of Cape War Capital, 
which is several years ago, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a researcher. I've done a lot of work on bias. Several years ago, it occurred to me that requiring a warm intro is inherently biased because it says my network and their network have to overlap. What well, is isn't the point that we want to hear new ideas, new pitches from new founders, and that that's actually where the real disruption is going to come from. So we abandoned requiring a warm intro, and one can submit their pitch deck via the Cape or Capital website. What it's done is obviously increased deal flow considerably, uh, but, and we do have team members go through each and every submission every Monday, they divide up what's come in in the last week and, and go through them. We have very importantly written checks to companies that came in that way where there is zero overlap between the, the networks of the founders and the investment team members. Uh, and that they, mm-hmm. you know, out of seeing more than 3,000 deals a year, they hit all of the, you know, all of the targets and we invested. So I think that's an important piece. You also mentioned sort of that things have changed a bit since George Floyd was murdered. And I want to distinguish the kind of frantic reaction to a considered path. Um, And right after the George Floyd murder, very many, very well-intentioned people from VC firms, from PE firms, from all over the tech ecosystem uh, reached out to us asking for help. They might have been looking for an entre- a black entrepreneur. Um, and they, they would reach out to any number of us and say, can you help? We need black, more black entrepreneurs. We need more deal flow mm-hmm. from black people. We need black team members. And it was as if they were, you know, ordering up from a grocery store. Like, tell me which aisle I can go down to find that black founder. Oh, black founders are in aisle 12. Where are black investment team members? Are they aisle seven? It was just this immediate response. Just go get me one of those, whatever the one of those was, without thinking through why is it that you've been a venture firm for 20 years and have never had a black team member and have never written a check to a black founder. That's where you need to start. And that's what I mean by holding up the mirror. And you can move very quickly examining our habits and saying, oh, there's a different, easy way to do this that will get us different results. Um, you know, the NBCA just did, released their latest human capital survey and found that just 16% of investment partners are women. Three percent are black, four percent Latinx, and while there have been some increases um, in junior positions in terms of check writer positions, it's been very flat. So if that if that partner um, or that principal, for example, has a founder reaching out to them that looks like them, and they pass it on to the senior GP, that GP might not, you know consider that deal in the same way because it wasn't their network. How did you manage that dynamic at KPOR if, if it even came up? Well, uh, given that we are looking at gap closing businesses, we understood the importance of a founder's lived experience. And to the degree to, that that lived experience and a deep understanding of various communities is reflected on our investment team, we understand that we are better investors. So some, it is really just linking the dots that get us to what's going to get us a better investment outcome. Uh, And so we didn't have the same obstacles because of our investment thesis uh, that many other firms uh, may actually um, have run into in the past and and continue to run into. We've heard all the stories about pattern matching in in Silicon Valley uh, for who's going to do something disruptive. But we've also seen a lot of very fabled, you know, blow ups and complete losses of those kinds of um, following that pattern matching. Yeah. And if you think your pattern is already great, why change it, right? Until 
you have these moments where you have to reflect on why you never had the, the diversity on your team or in your in your founder pool. I, I want to ask you a little bit about KPOR specifically for, for you know, for Fund Three. Mm-hmm. Um, you are handing over the MD responsibilities to two talented Black GPs, including Brian mm-hmm. uh, Dixon and, and Yuli Lee, uh, as well. They are not new to the fund. They've been working together for, for a decade. But can you tell me a little bit about your decision to, to step back and pass the baton? Well, uh, Liliana Vakpuri and Brian Dixon, as you mentioned, have been with us for about a decade. Um, and Brian made partner in 2015. Ulili started with us um, and then uh, went and got her MBA, worked at another firm and came back. Uh, and so she made partner in, in 2018. They are both fabulous investors uh, and they are completely complementary in terms of Brian's focusing on ed tech and fintech. Um, Ulili leads all of our healthcare and people ops tech um, work related, workforce development related uh, kinds of investments. Uh, so they have really complementary skill sets, which is fabulous. Uh, and they have, starting with Capo Capital One, Capo Capital Two, they have been doing one or both, the majority of investments in those prior funds. So they are completely seasoned. And when I talked about our impact report from 2019 and our uh, top quartile, actually exceeding top quartile financial returns, Brian and Lily deserve as much credit as Mitch and I do uh, for, for achieving those. So Mitch and I, as the two old white partners, uh, it's time for us to step back. Um, and this is something that we've been building for for quite a while. Uh, and so that the leadership at Cape War Center, the leadership at Smash.org, and the leadership at Cape War Capital are all um, people of color. They actually are all, all three organizations are led by Black people. And they've all, they're all being led by people who've been with us for a very long time. Uh, and, and that's mm-hmm. been intentional. I was going to say that's so powerful because even the concept of succession planning, period, let alone planning for this amazing diverse group of leadership to, to take over um, in the future, the leadership, and obviously I'm sure you will be there, but I, I don't even think succession planning of junior partners is something that is is as intentional maybe in the environment as it as it could be. Well, it really needs to be because the the lifespan of a VC fund is many, many years. I mean, and, and some it's stretching out, but it's sort of, you know, eight to 10 years before you can expect most of the companies that you invested in to have some, some kind of exit. So you, unless you're going to, unless you're planning to be around um, and see that fund through all of its 10 years. And then, of course, you're going to raise a new fund halfway through it. Um, so you keep making these 10-year commitments. So succession planning seems much more obvious and necessary in the context of VC than, than actually in, in corporate positions or, or other places where it's more common. Um, but one of the things I want to point out is the success of Cape War Capital is very much tied to this ecosystem. And the ecosystem we have in our own building in Oakland with Cape War Center, which is our philanthropic arm, our community engagement arm. We have a, just an amazing research group. Um, and then our other organization, Smash.org, which I founded 19 years ago, which is a nonprofit focused on uh, giving access to kids from low income, underrepresented communities of color, giving them access to STEM. So it's a program where we start with 14 year olds um, and stay mm-hmm. with them through their high school journey, help them get into college. And now we're working with actually working with them in college to create summer internships. Many of those summer internships are in Cape or Capital companies. Um, and so we see what we've been doing is fairly strategically, and some of it is opportunistically. We didn't have a grand plan um, quite like this with all the pieces, but we've got the grand vision, and then we take advantage of opportunities as they arise. 
Um, and one of the things I should do is give credit to Ulili, who 10 years ago started our summer associates program. And Brian Dixon, now partner, going to be general partner, co-managing partner with Ulili. Brian Dixon was our first summer associate. So he went from summer associate to partner and now going to be running his own fund. Um, and Ulili started that program because of her own experience of being in a, uh, uh, being in a cohort based scholarship program as an undergraduate. Uh, that is actually one that I also uh, co-founded at, at UC Berkeley. But the interesting thing is our summer associates are now working. So a summer associate, we've got Brian from the first class, but we will take anywhere from five, six, eight summer associates every year, um, giving them their first exposure in venture capital uh, and then they go on. They finish business school. They go on. It, we're, it's often between the first and second year of business school, but not exclusively. And then they go on. So our summer associates from many years ago are now doing full-time impact investing at Ford Foundation or at PayPal Ventures or at Magic Johnson Enterprises or with Mark Cuban companies. These are all placements where we've got people who are increasingly senior and check writers as you were talking about right. before. So we're talking about the possibility of seeding all of these individuals with the capital capital experience and investment thesis. And so for a small fund, we've had a, a pretty big ripple effect. Indeed. I mean, Black VC had shared some data around check writers and not even two dozen uh Check writers, uh, black check writers um, who can write over three million dollars exists, right? And so you've got <laughs> got a cadre of folks, mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at your firm. And a, I, I feel like the, there's a there are several lessons embedded in here, mm -hmm. but the ability to think long term is a hundred percent inherent in investing. It's part of the job. Right. But on this topic. Um, you know, we're having these rapid responses and fits and starts and we're not being intentional and in the same way that we were intentional in the long term about our investments. And it sounds like that needs to, to coalesce better. Well, exactly. My, my last question to you is if you are, you know, uh, you know, a managing partner at a firm or, or someone who, who did look at last summer and last spring and go, well, whoa, <laughs> um, clearly something has got to change. And maybe maybe you did try the grocery store aisle approach for a little bit. Um, what, Where would you recommend that they start? Would it be holding up that mirror and looking at their own practices? Um, yeah. How, how would you suggest that someone just start to navigate this journey a little bit differently? Well, I definitely would suggest holding up a mirror is helpful. There's lots and lots of resources out there in terms of things that you can read. I think it would be useful um, to do a quick scan. There are many, many new funds that are focused on investing in Black founders or Black and Latinx founders or women founders. Um, and although most of them are pretty small, I think it would be useful uh, to hear their stories and to look at their portfolios and to figure out, are there some co-investments? Do you want to work on deal flow together? How can you find a path into that ecosystem? And how can we bring all of these otherwise siloed ecosystems together? Uh, so I think there are a lot of of things you can leverage that are all about building your business, but also about diversifying your network. This is it's this is such practical advice, um, and I, I I'm taking copious notes <laughs> because every time it reinforces for me. Um, but I do believe this is something that that any firm can do. Um, Thank you so much for your time, Frida. This is the first, I'm sure, of, of many Great. conversations, uh, but really appreciate your time and perspective. My pleasure and always a delight to speak with you.